Thank you for joining us today for this virtual event and moderated panel discussion with Q&A. We ask that you please use the Q&A function to submit any questions. I am Rose Delma Serafin, Assistant Director of the Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs at the Warren Alpert Medical School. In this special event marking celebrations for Black History Month, jointly organized with the School of Public Health, we are featuring the voices of outstanding Black female voices, leaders. These exceptional women who we will hear from today have been incredible and innovative advocates for Black health. Before we begin this discussion, we would like to take a moment of silence to acknowledge all those who have been lost as a result of COVID-19 and racial injustice this year and within the, year, the past years. Names we know like George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and Breonna Taylor, and those we do not know. In hearing directly from these inspirational leaders today, we hope others in the audience will be empowered and inspired to advance work to achieve black health equity through advocacy, rigorous science, cutting edge medicine and public health. Let me now introduce my partner from the School of Public Health, Jamie Potter Rutledge. Thank you, Rose Delma. Welcome all. My name is Jamie Potter Rutledge. I am the program manager for diversity and inclusion initiatives at the School of Public Health. We hope that you are all healthy and thriving through what has been an incredibly difficult year. It has been almost a year since the COVID-19 pandemic directly and drastically altered our lives. And the racial unrest we see in our country continues to reinforce just how important engaged advocacy in social justice and ensuring equity for all. In our discussion today, we will explore a range of issues that impact the health of the Black community and hear strategies for closing the gaps in health equity that are present within the Black community. <clears throat> we will be recording this session today so that you may refer to it later as a resource. We will be sure to share it with all that have registered for this event. And now it is my honor to introduce you to Dr. Millicent Gorham. Dr. Millicent Gorham is the Executive Director of the National Black Nurses Association Incorporated, which represents 308,000 African-American nurses in the United States. Millicent was appointed to that position in October of 1995. She handles all administrative fund development, advocacy, communications, marketing, and conference planning with a staff of five and a budget of 1.8 million. Millicent has more than 35 years of government relation experience. For four years, she worked as the health legislative assistant to the US representative, Louis Stokes, a Democrat from Ohio. She was the coordinator of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust. She served as the Assistant Director of Government Relations for the American Optometric Association for eight years. And for four years, Millicent worked as a Director of Government Relations for the National Rural Health Association. Dr. Gorham serves on the boards of Simmons University, her alma mater, also my alma mater, the United Medical Center, a hospital in Southeast Washington, DC, and the Association of Black Cardiologists. It is a pleasure to welcome you to Brown and to allow our community to engage and learn from you. Rose Delma will introduce our next panelist. Thank you, Jamie. Dr. Mullen is Associate Dean for Health Equity at Dell Medical School, as well as an Associate Professor in the school's Population Health and Internal Medicine Departments. She also serves as Director of Health Equity at Ascension Seton to help meet health equity goals across its systems. Dr. Mullen is an internist, epidemiologist, public health expert, and the former Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HSS. While at HSS, she served as the Acting Assistant Secretary for Health 
and the acting director of the National Vaccine Program Office during the months between the Obama and Trump administrations. Prior to her time at HSS, Dr. Mullen served for five years as commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Public Health. Her career has spanned clinical, research, teaching, and administrative roles focused on improving the health of all people, especially those who are underserved. Dr. Mullen is recognized nationally and internationally as a leader in building effective community-based chronic disease prevention programs and for her commitment to improving individual and population health by strengthening coordination between community, public health, and healthcare systems. A former president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, Dr. Mullen is a current member of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report Editorial Board, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Policies for Action National Advisory Committee, and the Change Lab Solutions Board of Directors. She also is a member of the Study Committee on Equitable Allocation of COVID-19 Vaccine at the National Academics of Science, Engineering, and Medicine a former member of the advisory committee to the CDC's director and its subcommittee on health disparities, Dr. Mullen chaired the CDC's breast, cancer, breast and cervical cancer uh, early detection and control federal Ad advisory committee. It is our pleasure to have Dr. Mullen with us today. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Joseph Diaz, who will introduce our moderator for this event. Thank you, Rose Delma. So I'm Joe Diaz, I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity and Multicultural Affairs here at the Warren Alpert Medical School. And on behalf of the medical school and the School of Public Health, I am pleased to welcome you and thank you all and our panelists for joining us this evening for this important discussion. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our moderator, Dr. Vanessa Brito. Dr. Brito is a graduate of Dartmouth College and the University of Illinois College of Medicine. She completed a residency and fellowship in general internal medicine here at Brown, and then a master's of science with a major in community health also here at Brown. A fellow of the American College of Physicians, Dr. Brito is an expert in student and college health and has held leadership roles on the local, regional, and national level. She was the director of health services at Wellesley College from 2001 until her return here to Brown in 2018. She is now Brown's associate vice president for campus life and the executive director of health and wellness where she oversees health services, counseling and psychological services, health promotion, accessibility services, and emergency medical services. So Dr. Brito, thank you for keeping our community health healthy and thank you for serving as tonight's moderator. At this point, I will turn it off to Dr. Brito and thank you again. Thank you, Joe. Thank you all. I am thrilled to be here with my new colleagues uh, that I'm, I'm meeting for the first time hopefully it won't be the last time. My only regret is that we can't do this in person, but um, circumstances being what they are, uh, I'm looking forward to having a wonderful spirited conversation and we're all looking forward to learning from, uh, from both of you. So thank you both for, for joining us this evening. I'd like to start with um, a, a question that is um, something that will help us get to know you a little bit, and it has to do with your life experiences. Um, personal, professional, either would be fine. If you could reflect on what have been the most influential uh, experiences that have led you to the work that you uh, currently do. Uh, why don't we start with Dr. Borum? Well, thank you so much. It's wonderful to meet both of you and to the Brown University community for inviting me. My most influential experiences have been working on Capitol Hill and working at the State House, Massachusetts State House. They were the, the foundation of those experiences have really uh, kept me solid along the, along the way. I've worked as a intern, public relations intern for State Senator Bill Owens of Massachusetts. And I got a chance to meet a lot of people in the Boston area that I don't think that I would have ever had a chance to meet who were in the bit on the business side of things. 
and they exposed me to a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and corporate people in the Boston area. And I was able to then take that, that experience back to Simmons College, then Simmons College, and put together a program on women uh, entrepreneurs. So that started me on my, on my political career. And then working with Congressman Lewis Stokes of Ohio was an amazing experience. He was the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust. More importantly, he was on the, com the budget committee and the uh, appropriations committee. So I got to see all of that up close and personal about how money, how we get money to all these programs. And so that experience working with the Congressional Black Caucus members and putting on health programs four times a year, legislative uh, programs four times a year, really was a foundation for my career. Thank you very much. There is something to be said about um, learning how the sausage is made. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, great. Dr. Dr. Mullen? I appreciate being here and the question. And I feel as if um, listening to Billie Holiday sing as we were preparing the talk set me up for this question. Because that song, God Bless the Child That's Got Its Own, is something that my father used to say. He would, today would be his 98th birthday. And so my greatest influence is growing up with two parents who really um, encouraged us to see the world and people around us up close, our neighbors in our community with um, an understanding that no matter how much or how little we had, we were privileged um, maybe didn't have as much as some other people, more than some other people, but not better than anyone. And that there was always something that we could do. And, you know, growing up in the 60s, having parents that encouraged you to do that and taught you how to stand your ground because they knew what you were going to potentially go through as a little Black girl who was smart or just as a Black child in general without putting it in your head that you had a problem because you were black, um, I think gave me more backbone than any vertebrae that I was built, was born with, to know how to stand up for myself and to stand up for what's right on behalf of other people. And I've been able to carry that through college, through medical school, all with, with some sense of, um, it's really not trite to say you wanna be a doctor because you wanna help people. It's really, it's really is true that public health is like social justice in the way in which I see it. And, and so that's been really important because it builds confidence that makes you also carry yourself into some of the places uh, like congressional meetings or other, other venues where you know you belong, where you don't have to look alongside the wall for your seat because your seat's at the table too, and because you have a voice. And, and so, no, I've had great experiences. They've been transformative. I've had wonderful mentors and, I've, and along the way, I've also learned how not to let other people get in my head and get in my way. And all that makes a difference. Um, and so I think that that would be, the, the thing that I would say the most. And, you know, here I am 60 years later and still saying life is still not fair, which means I'll never run mm -hmm. to do. Thank you for that. Having those early heroes and sheroes in our lives, we, we, we've stood on their shoulders and continue to, to think about all of those life lessons that we learned so early. Thank you. And so as you think about your identities as, as Black women, as leaders in your field, uh, public health experts, there are so many identities that you, that you carry, that you hold. Um, if there's an identity that you lead with, could you share that with us? We'll start with Dr. Mullen. 
my inner voice always reminds me and is willing and willing to say to other people, I'm just a regular person, no matter what you hear. And sometimes my mother would say, don't say that about yourself, but I'm just a regular person. But I have learned because people will assign things to me based on what, what I look like, you know, what my genes are or whatever. I lead with being a leader. That's where I start because um, that's what my, that's the path I've chosen. Those are the roles that I have undertaken. And that's how I choose to model profession for young men and women now. Uh, because a lot of people want positions and titles, but to be able to really be a leader and make change is, is also a skill set. So, so that's, what, that's where I start. I think I start with advocate. Hmm. I am an advocate for the National Black Nurses Association. I'm an advocate for nurses worldwide. I am an advocate for my mentor, my mentees, who I need to make sure that they're that they want to be leaders. I have uh, mentees who say to me, "She is." hard as nails, soft as cotton. And my, my thing with all of that is, I need for you to understand that if you're, if you're coming to me to be helpful to you, then what I'm expecting is that you're going to be a leader in this world. And so I'm going to advocate for you the best that I possibly can. So with, with everything, when I think about my career and I think about all of the legislation and all of the, like Dr. Mullen, all the places where we've, tables where we've sat and places where we've advocated for um, all different kinds of, of health legislation and, and health programs that people have no clue that, no clue that the three of us have probably taken on the world and advocated for some things that no one ever knows anything about. But we're just grateful to be at the table and grateful to be able to lend our expertise. And we are the kinds of leaders that we expect all of the people from Brown University to be when they leave from there. <laughs> that is great. That's super. And if we could um, maybe shift to think about some of the ways in which um, your advocacy, Dr. Gorham, and your leadership, Dr. Mullen, um, play a role in impacting the, the health and health equity within the Black community. What would you say uh, is the greatest threat um, to achieving uh, health equity within the Black community? Not a small question, right? <laughs> Not even a little tiny small question. So let me jump out there. I think the greatest threat is economic insecurity. You know, poverty in this country is a, uh, is a reality um, that we have to look square in the, in the face. And if our country is going to be the best, the greatest that we already are and exhibit that to the world, we're really going to have to do something about poverty in this country and raise up the level of economic security. I, I just want to bring it home where people can, young people can really understand it because people like me are heading towards retirement and paying for this Medicare, um, Medicare co-pays. And we, we take a look at our parents. You all need to be taking a look at your parents and maybe your grandparents, and think about them being on limited income. And limited income right now looks like they can still travel if we ever get out of this pandemic. They can still be able to enjoy themselves, to do different kinds of recreational things. But then all of a sudden, they need to use their health care insurance and begin looking at the substantial co-pays that they have on limited income. And then we start looking around when they have multiple um, healthcare issues. 
on limited income. And when we start thinking about that, they may be start to look at some of the young people for help because they don't have the funds in order to do it. So when, you, when we talk about economic insecurity in this country, we need to think about how we're gonna uh, increase the wealth. We're gonna to have to think about how we're going to educate our children. And that, that means both college and non-college so that they can sustain their own lives. And we need to be able to think about it in such a way that they're planning for not just getting by making ends meet, but in such a way that they'll be able to sustain their lives for a long period of time. So it is really about economic insecurity. That's the major threat. We've got to be able to have access to health care, but you have got to be able to pay for it. I. Uh, signed on, the National Black Nurses Association signed on to a letter today to increase the appropriations for vaccinations for the country. And when you look at it from the standpoint of vaccinations or preventive medicine that everybody in this country should be able to have access to, but there's still places where they don't have access to it. And there are places where they're mandating that people who don't really have the means to pay for it. So we've got to deal with economic insecurity in this country. So I would like to give you my response, which also relates to economics, um, economic inequality. When I think about whether or not we're really at some, some pivotal time now when, when we are going to undertake um, racial equity and make it a reality in this country. I'm concerned that as long as it's in the interest of the people who are most privileged and hold the most power to preserve it, then we're only gonna go so far because people will support those whose policies that perpetuate economic inequality will um, supersede um, policies for racial justice. And I worry sometimes that even as we have a lot of enthusiasm now, that there is a movement to, for organizational anti-racism, there will be lots of folks lots of powerful people who won't get in the way of that and maybe even sign on to it as long as their economic policies don't have to change because it's the economic inequality that is driving so much. And, and without getting any more political than necessary, you know, I think whenever we ask ourselves, how do we end up with the same kinds of people who don't promote the policies that we need it might be because they voted first around economics before they voted around uh, or made policies around racial justice. So that concerns me uh, because um, we have a growing, uh, you know, growing experience of racial strife over things that might have racism at, at fundamental to some of it, but that some people really don't even realize they're in the same sinking boat. <laughs> Just stop there. I don't think I need to say anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is everything that you have both said is spot on. And it just really um, sort of drives home the point in terms of how layered and how complex um, these issues are and how they're, they're interconnected. And so I'm thinking about um, how we bring um, a strategy to um, addressing some of these complex issues in a public health setting, for example, like Brown or in the, uh, in the School of Public Health or um, in a nursing curriculum or uh, in a graduate school or medical school curriculum. How do we bring some of that thinking 
uh, into the curriculum as we're preparing professionals to go out into the world and deal with some of these really complex issues. Dr. Gorham? I think that you have to teach students that they have to learn how to advocate for themselves. And by that, I mean, in terms of some of the policies that are coming down, I'll just take a couple of them. One, debt. You know, school is expensive, but how can we get the older people and our colleagues to contribute to the universities for scholarships, for programs that will help these students not come out of school with substantial amount of debt. Because it takes so much more for them to then contribute to society because they have this amount of debt and all they're thinking about is, how can I get rid of the debt? So from a standpoint of economic utility in this country, helping them to advocate for themselves, advocate for reduction in the debt um, that they will, that they are having to have to have and pushing them towards advocating at the local state and national level about policies that deal with human compassion, kindness, and healthcare, and making sure that they understand that that is part of their responsibility. It's not enough to get your degree, that when you're seeing people who don't have, um, that you must go out and advocate for them. When we're talking about, for example, homeless people, um, I have a nurse during the beginning of the pandemic who decided that she was going to get all kinds of baskets and um, uh, masks and hand sanitizer. That's how you begin to advocate for people when they don't have. And so it's beyond what you do for getting your degree to helping to move that needle to make sure that someone else's life is better at the end of the day. Thank you. Dr. Mullen. So there's so many ways to think about this question working at a medical school that's relatively new. We just graduated our first class. And that- Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Uh, has built a reputation on having a, a social mission which the students are holding the administration to. That being said, um, for everyone who comes into medical school so driven by their own mission, I remind them that first they have to graduate. And that, and I, and I was, I worked in um, university health on two different campuses earlier in my career. So student social and emotional well being and self care are really important. And that, that continues into medical school. It gets even more important. Um, because I've met so many students who by the time they're first and second year, they're already thinking about the big thing they wanna do professionally. And so I try to slow them down without sounding as if I'm trying to hold them back and say, you know, small is really big. You don't have to have the title. You don't have to, there's only one Surgeon General at a time. You don't have to be the Surgeon General. Um, but to, and, and to also for the minoritized students, who are also taking on so much, I tell them, you just, you paid, you know, you paid to get an education. You didn't come to, to give one. So don't come in here and take on the responsibility for the school to be everything it needs to be because you have to take care of yourself and learn. And, 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 to, and that kind of, uh, uh, hopefully that kind of advice will be sustaining for them because nobody wants to fight a battle through their whole career. I don't know, Dr. Brito, you're, you do student well-being. 
so so that's so and I'm really happy to be on this panel with the nurse because I think part of of um, really pushing for for equity in health is to really foster interprofessional education and learning. And doctors and nurses can do a lot around social determinants of health and the ways in which we address it. Health systems also need to improve the quality of care that they give. And we're, we can both be drivers of that along with people in humanities um, to bring in um, empathy and compassion. So all of that needs to roll in more. And then for, for students who are so into allyship, what I ask them to think about is whether or not they're also accomplices. Like, are you really ready? Like, not just you, do you have, do you have somebody's back from over there, but are you standing on the front lines with them? Or are you doing things even when they're not there to, to really know that difference? So that's some of what I think it'll take over time. Dr. Mullen, yes. Dr. Brito, Dr. Mullen. Yes. I just want to make sure that the record is clear that I am not a nurse. Oh. I am representing the National Black Nurses Association for the past 26 years as its executive director. And the best that I have is to lay my left hand on you if something goes wrong and I can begin to pray and <laughs> flip out my cell phone and dial 911. <laughs> Okay, well, you're, you're, close, you're, you're close enough for me. How's that? Prayers are you. helpful. <laughs> I'll take it. So I, I just like to add to that. I mean, I, I think what you both have said is really, really important. And as you're thinking about, um, you know, an institution that is really committed to health equity and, and, and teaching health equity and, and really integrating it into the curriculum. Can you think of a model institution as you, both of you have a bird's eye view of the country, you've interfaced with so many uh, institutions in your walk and can you speak to some of the uh, administrative tools that you think are helpful, some of the leadership commitments? How, how do you think institutions like Brown can help drive this this message, message of, of health equity. How can we how can we lead and, and help produce leaders who who are thinking uh, about this issue? Well, let me just say, um, we have a mission. We aspire to be a model. Part of my leadership as the associate dean for health equity is to make our accomplishments match our aspirations, and we're not there yet. But we have to be honest with ourselves about that, and and so that's that's important. And and um, everything that people say about strategies to advance equity are only going to succeed if there's a buy-in at the most senior leadership level. Not just verbal buy-in is really key. Um, I believe uh, that students can drive a lot of the change. Because education is, is a competitive marketplace like a lot of others. Schools brand themselves. Students um, help brand the school. Students advocate for change. We, are, we have an organization at Del Med, um, medical, um, making equity a shared value in healthcare. Um, students did a survey because they, they met resistance um, when they requested to have required curriculum on, on race and racism incorporated in the basic sciences. So when I arrived there in 2018, that was one of the things that I took on um, just to see, to understand the resistance. Um, but they ended up doing a survey. So they got, they got the data and, and found that students said 60, to 70% of the time when they brought up issues around race and ethnicity, both to faculty and to students, they felt that they were disregarded, dismissed. And, and so having the administration actually see those data was a driver that when I created our 
with a group, our health equity strategy for the school, when they came to me and said, can we say this has to change now because of the strategy? I could say to them, no, say the strategy supports what you've already said you wanted and what needs to happen. And so we've now just had um, our medical education leadership work with the group to create educational competencies around health equity and race. So that's gonna change. I'm gonna stop by saying though, we can't say what students need to learn and do if we don't teach the faculty how to, to, to do it. instruct them. So we, there's another whole bit of work to be done. And I, don't, I can't really say from my conversations that anybody is a model, but there are lots of people trying to get things done. The model that I want to put out there is the National Black Nurses Association's model. So MBNA has been around for 50 years. We'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. And we have 108 chapters in 34 states. And within those chapters, we developed uh, two of our nurses, past presidents, Dr. Linda Burns Bolton and Dr. C. Alicia Georges developed the collaborative model that is the foundation for MBNA. And that model says we go out and do healthcare education, healthcare screenings in the community. And we take the students along with the nurses to educate the community so that when they leave the university setting, they are already, they already have the foundation that says, this is what we do. This is how we go out and be a help beyond what we do when we are working on our shifts, beyond the 40 hours of work that we normally do or the 40 to 60 hours that we normally do. We take this to the community and we have the community to determine what those issues are. It's not enough for the nurse to say, oh, well, I think that we need to have uh, high blood pressure screenings when we actually need to have uh, education around uh, lead uh, paint in, in housing. So that's the very foundation and helps to move the needle in terms of getting health uh, access to health care. Um, many years ago, we, we, when I first came to MBNA, we had at our annual conference, we always have a, a, a health fair. And we took the health fair to, to the city council in, in New York City. And the nurses did healthcare screenings there along with the students providing all different kinds and array of healthcare screenings. And it's not enough to just do the screenings. You have to be able to tell the, the person you know, what that screening actually means. And then you have to be able to provide them the resources if things are a little bit askew in terms of that assessment. And so they literally uh, had told people, okay, you, your blood pressure is a little too high. Your blood pressure is a lot high. Oh no, your blood pressure is totally out of whack. You need to go straight to the emergency room. And that's the kind of thing that the students, while participating with the nurses, begin to better understand what it means to provide community, community care. One of the things that MBNA is involved in this year is the launch of the uh, Commission on Racism in Nursing. It is a commission that is being sponsored by the National Black Nurses Association, the uh, American Nurses Association, the National Association of Hispanic Nurses, and the National Coalition of Ethnic Minority Nurse Associations. And so what we're looking at are those institutional, um, from an educational point of view, from the facility point of view, from policies that are generated by our government on what how can we stem racism in this country and help to move that needle towards health equity? Thank you both. I think the points that you've raised are really, uh, really, really poignant. And I'm really proud to say that Brown has taken, uh, the School of Public Health has taken on the, uh, 
important role of, of establishing health equity scholars in partnership with Tougaloo College. And so we're looking forward to leading by example, as you say. Uh, and, uh, and Dr. Gorham, I really appreciate what you've talked about in terms of you know, getting involved in the community and bringing students into the laboratory. The community is the, is the laboratory. And so I would be remiss if we didn't talk about an issue that is front and center in the community, something that we're all talking about and thinking about, and that is some of the ways in which COVID-19 is playing out uh, in, in disproportionately in black and brown communities. And I'm thinking particularly about um, the issue of vaccine distribution and allocation and how, uh, how states are, and communities, municipalities are um, choosing to, to uh, distribute the, the vaccine. I wonder if, if each of you could sort of speak to where you think um, some of the learning could, uh, could, could come from. Uh, and as it pertains to, to this issue in, uh, in the uh, community. Where do you think our adv advocacy should be and, and how should that be playing, playing itself out? I had this conversation with my president just before. Dr. Martha Dawson is the president of the National Black Nurses Association. And just before I got on the call, she, she lamented about her sister getting... Um, standing in the line to get her shot. And she lamented that there were only going to be 100 shots, 100 vaccinations. And her sister got in the line at six o'clock that morning to get her vaccination. And there was a long, long line People have been there even before that time. And so it, it, the, the conversation was around why aren't the people who are give, getting out the message that the vaccinations are available, just telling them, telling everybody, the first 100 people. So that when you get in that line and you can kind of see what those cars look like and you know that you look like you might be the 200th car, that that's not where you need to be if there are only 100. So the 100 vaccinations. So the issue really is about the rollout. We are advocating, the National Black Nurses Association is advocating for the vaccination. We are working with the national, the Black Coalition Against COVID. And that, and I know Dr. Mullen knows very much about that. Uh, we're working with uh, the four black medical schools, the National Medical Association, uh, blackdoctor.org, and it's all been pushed out there by Dr. Uh, Reed Tuxen. And so our president, Dr. Martha Dawson, has been on uh, blackdoctor.org any number of times as other um, of her colleagues, uh, both in the medical and in other arenas with uh, National Urban League, NAACP, um, with Reverend Al Sharpton have all been on blackdoctor.org and other places, really putting out the information on what the science says and debunking the myths. And if we are honest about why people are hesitant because of past mistrusts in the healthcare system, but then how do we get past those mistrusts? And we get past some of those mistrusts by having experts, researchers, physicians, nurses who look like us, who are trusted by us um, to get that message out to them. So we're working with that particular coalition. We're working with the Ad Council um, on getting the message out. We're working with the Pfizer. Pfizer Pharmaceutical Company has an Ad Council as well. We are also working with Johnson & Johnson on making sure that the nurses better understand the difference between vaccine hesitancy and vaccine acceptance. Um, 
and how they can begin to get that message out among all of the nurses and then the nurses getting that information out to the communities. Nurses are considered the most trusted healthcare provider, the most trusted professional. What can I say? That's just the Gallup poll telling the truth. And so we want to make sure that people that look like us get that message out regarding that about the vaccine. We want scientific information to get out, evidence-based information to get out about the vaccine. But we also want to make sure that th those that have control over it, to make sure that they're being transparent and honest about how they're actually getting the, the dealing with the rollout because there's nothing going to be more upsetting to people to to feel like oh well you're telling me to get the get the vaccine but then when I go to get it it's not available so we do want to try to make sure that we we have all the ducks in a row before we actually get that information out there thank you Dr. Mullen so I heard your comments on CNN, so I know you have something to say about this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, just a little. So having been on, and having, I mean, it was an honor to be on the National Academy of Science, Engineering, Medicine um, Study Committee on Equitable Allocation. And, and it was um, fitting and timely that the NIH and CDC asked the National Academies to convene a group to address equitable allocation because we're already acknowledging equity is something that we're still striving for. And why wouldn't there be inequity in vaccine allocation when you consider that anything else that's a limited resource, you know, people with less power and resource are gonna get it last or not as quickly. Not at all. And, and, and we knew, and part of what we were dealing and we've been dealing with for the past two and a half months is an issue of scarcity. So to embed and to have a framework for equity from the beginning, knowing that there wouldn't be enough for everyone, because even if there were enough for everyone, we'd have to worry about equity. But in the context of scarcity, to have a, have a fair, just, transparent system that people could use was really important. But you know, I've said to people many times, there's a big difference between what's on paper and what gets done. And in, in addition to uh, lessons in what equity and inequities are, we also have gotten some civics lessons through this because people might think, everybody who has thought, we need a national plan and national leadership. There are certain things that states and, and local governments are actually in charge of, no matter what somebody in, in Washington says. And, and so um, I have started talking about the handoffs on equity as they go from the federal level to the state level because governors can make their own plans. And then, you know, hospitals can do their own thing. So that's one piece. Another piece that's been really important as we've talked about African-Americans, African-Americans are not a monolithic group. I have said, if you see a black person, don't see vaccine hesitance stamped on their forehead. And I have been concerned. I get concerned sometimes, although I understand the importance of racial concordance. I also say, if you want a black doctor that you can relate to, you need to be able to relate to the black doctor that you see, because it doesn't always just happen like that for people. And I'm, you know, the anecdotal side of me has plenty of friends and family who just can't wait to get their vaccine. And at the same time that we stand up for um, finally wanting community organizations to get paid to assist health systems, instead of just being the free work that you call when somebody needs to engage a, com a community, there's this other side that we can't harm ourselves by also suggesting or get, giving people the excuse, potential excuse, oh, the numbers are bad because of vaccine hesitancy. I gave a talk a week ago or two weeks ago on being intellectually honest about what's going on because there are, there are places that 
haven't gotten to making an equity an add-on yet. It wasn't embedded in their plan from the beginning, just like it wasn't with testing. And it was only after we started to see some of the COVID disparities data in April that suddenly, you know, even in places where maybe there's only race or ethnicity data on 50% of the cases, or in Texas where it's sometimes only 3% of the cases are race or ethnicity data, we make excuses, we don't have good enough data, or we scramble to make up for lost time, which lost time is calculated into lost lives and lost productivity and lost income. And so that's what we can't abide. We can't continue to say, we're gonna get around to it. Or in the same way that people, people are not their pre-existing conditions, people don't create the inequities that they have to live through either. So we have to address those. But I don't want to preach because we already have somebody who put her left hand on me. <laughs> so. But am I answering your question? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And we 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 don't have much time left. And so I certainly want the audience to, if they have any questions, to, to put them in the chat and we'll try to take them up. But before we uh, wrap up, we have a few more minutes. I'm going to throw a little twist into our conversation and we're going to go into a little bit of a lightning round. I hope that's okay. Um, so my, uh, the lightning round is just, I want you to just, whatever pops into your head, I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to just, um, uh, just free, freestyle as they say. Okay. All right. um, so my first question is, what one word of advice would you share with your younger self and how best to prepare for the career path that involves addressing health equity? Networking. Great. Great, great. Live Anything? your passion. Live, live your passion. Live your passion in networking. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Book have you read recently? I know both of you are so busy. You, you probably haven't had much time to read for pleasure. But if you, if you uh, could share with us, what book have you read recently that stayed with you and maybe why? The Color of Law. Mm. Oh my, I've, I have learned that to be better at my job, I need to know more history. I was a mm -hmm. science and math person. And so every time we start talking structural and you know what the root, root, root causes are, the color of law, Richard Rothstein. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Sorry, I haven't had a chance to read this <laughs> forever. I'm just gonna be transparent. Other, other, you, other than reading, other than reading the Bible at, at you know my five chapters in the morning, that's as much as I can give to you. That's a, you get you. That's not even a pass. That's a good <laughs> read. I do want to tell you though, I have gotten my dean and some of our senior leaders. We have been working our way through um, some sections of white fragility, and I know not mm. that book, but in terms of mm. building competencies, that's yes, what doing at the medical school. Yes, excellent, excellent. Well, I just want to say. This has really been a delightful conversation. I have learned a lot. I have uh, just en thoroughly enjoyed uh, the, the points that you both raised. And thank you again for taking the time to be with us here at Brown. And I'm going to turn the conversation over to my colleague, Dr. Carolyn Kuo, who's going who's to wrap things up for us. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What an what a invigorating discussion. And thank you, Dr. Britta, for moderating. Again, my name is Caroline Quo, and I serve as Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at the School of Public Health. It's my pleasure to just offer a few words in closing. You know, I just leave this discussion inspired. I heard so many ideas here along with the audience that I think really captures the magic of that, that journey that you both have taken. And the conversation today also underscores the importance of advancing health equity, specifically health equity in Black communities, and that that requires thinking outside the box, working across disciplines, championing exceptional science as we heard from both of you, and driving strategies in medicine and public health and nursing that are effective. I think one of the most important pieces of the conversation was how higher education institutions really need to continue to find ways to mentor, support, train, and advance diverse talent in these fields. 
And that really is needed to carry forth the next generation who can follow after your, your footsteps. Um, so our schools continue to expand these efforts and train the next generation of leaders. We heard pieces of conversation today that inspire us to, to take some new directions forward and to re, re, you know, invigorate our efforts. And um, I'm so excited you know, that we'll continue to expand our commitment to partnering with the Health Equity Scholars Program to all HBCUs in this forthcoming year at the School of Public Health. So I look forward to continuing these conversations with audience, not just during this month, of course, but throughout the year. And so in closing, I really just wanna thank Drs. Gora, Mullen, and Brito for sharing your precious time um, in such a, you know, time, uh, in, in a time that is, you know, calling for so much of your leadership and for sharing your ideas with us this evening. Thank you to the great audience as well. Good evening, everyone. Thank you again.